This presentation is on toxic weeds or toxic plants in pastures and particularly how it affects horses. Typically we see animals eating toxic plants only when they're starving or when pastures are overgrazed or during a drought, um, when the weeds are still green but the pasture grass is not. Or, or sometimes when it's accidentally included in hay or feed. Sometimes animals, especially like foals, are just curious and want to try the plant. Uh, and then we have some plants that just taste good, like the red maple. And then we also see household plants, uh, landscape plants are, are toxic most often. And, and then we have some weeds in pastures and hay belts that can be toxic too. And several years ago, we had Bermuda grass. That was toxic. So what happened there was we had Bermuda grass that accumulated a lot of nitrates and actually killed uh, 15 head of cattle in Texas. So even our normal grasses that are fine sometimes under the right conditions can be toxic as well. So some of those conditions can be post-fertilization, um, recent herbicide application, some drought, frost, cool cloudy days. So first example of a Toxic weed is one that I particularly hate. It's showy crotillaria. So this contain, uh, contains alkaloid monocrotillanes. Uh, chickens, horses, cattle, swine are all affected. Uh, can affect uh, goats, sheep, mules, and, and dogs also. All parts are poisonous, but the seeds are particularly toxic. Next, we have pokeweed. Uh, you say what? Pokeweed? People use to eat pokeweed salad or poke salad. Yes, but they boiled it and got the oxalic acid and the saponin out uh, before they ate it. So it's alkaloids uh, that are present too. So cattle, horses, swine, humans, uh, severe gastrointestinal upset is what this causes. Uh, next, we have sickle pod or, or its relative coffee senna. Uh, they contain several toxins, but the chemical that is of main importance has not been identified. It causes muscle and liver degeneration and can rapidly lead to death. Um, it also can cause some abdominal symptoms. Uh, the seeds are especially toxic, uh, although the whole plant contains toxins. Uh, all right, so bracken fern, it's uh, thiaminase in, in activates thiamine or vitamin B1. Uh, it's chronic in its effect, means that it has to be cumulative in nature, so it has to build up in their system. Now, I threw lantana in there. Uh, most horses aren't going to be affected by lantana, but other livestock species are. Um, it affects the skin and the liver of other livestock species. Next up is yellow jessamine. It's a climbing vine. It contains all kinds of toxins, alkaloids, jessamine, Gelsaminin, uh, gelsaminidine, uh, is it, related to strychnine. Uh, bees are highly affected by this, uh, the pollen of, of yellow jessamine. Um, humans can be affected by sec sucking the nectar. Uh, so uh, this is uh, toxic to a wide host of, uh, of species. So Chinese tallow is toxic, all parts are toxic. Uh, but typically animals aren't going to eat this unless they don't have any other option of anything to eat. Now I put creeping indigo in the presentation. We, we typically don't see a lot of that up our way, but it has been making its way this way. Uh, typically it's found in South Florida. It contains two toxic chemicals for horses and it has neurological signs as well as non-neurological signs, making it a little more difficult to identify. This is red maple. Uh, I have to admit that this tree is actually the one you see is actually in my front yard. Uh, wilted leaves are toxic. They affect horses and cattle. My dad argued up and down when we planted that tree many, many, many years ago that it was a sweet gum. Uh, it is in fact a red maple and therefore will be coming down here shortly. Uh, it causes weakness, rapid heart rate, respiration, uh, depression, and brownish colored urine and blood. That's one distinct sign. And then we have perilla mint. It, it contains perilla ketone. It causes pulmonary edema. Now this uh, weed can be sometimes confused with our vervain, uh, but the vervain grows to be several feet tall, whereas the perilla mint will stay shorter. 
Now, I included oxalis or, or yellow wood sorrel. Uh, it's typically not a problem in the U.S., but I have seen it here in our county. Um, it contains oxalates and it causes kidney failure. So if horses develop a taste for this yellow wood sorrel, uh, it can cause a problem. So all of our prunus species, uh, cherry laurel, uh, choke cherry, cherry prunes, peaches, all of those uh, contain prussic acid. And so that causes difficulty breathing, bloat, anxiousness, staggering, and, then, and even convulsions uh, leading to death. Uh, death can occur within an hour of ingestion if they ingest enough. So another one of our landscape or home plants that causes a problem uh, besides the prunus species is azaleas or rhododendrons. And it has a toxin in it. And, and typically it's only winter time that we see this uh, if they have uh, fields that used to have homesteads in them or, or have azaleas planted near them. Um, it, it'll be the only green thing and they'll eat it. It causes damage to the heart, the nervous system, and the digestive tract. So China berry trees are a problem. Uh, it's going to cause, uh, or it has some known and unknown toxins in it. The berries are most toxic. Uh, it's commonly just a digestive tract issue, but it can affect the entire central nervous system and cause seizures. And so there are many, many, many more uh, tropical soda, apple, horse nettle, anything in the nightshade family, which includes tomatoes and peppers, um, sea myrtle, mountain laurel, tongue laurel, milkweed, uh, all the laurels that are in the Spruna species, the hemlocks, uh, deturis, cassias, privet, oleander, boxwood, hydrangea, all of those uh, can be toxic. So these are two of my favorite references for toxic plants, poisonous plants of the southeastern United States and a guide to plant poisoning of animals in North America. Uh, the guide to plant poisoning is my absolute favorite uh, reference for toxic plants. So get out there, look in your pasture, scout for the weeds. The younger the weeds are, the easier they are to kill. Catch the weeds before they spread throughout the whole field. Spraying small areas is easier than trying to control a big, huge weed problem. Uh, pest management begins with proper identification. Take a picture, go online, use Google Lens, send a picture to me, uh, send it through text message or email. Um, call the extension office if you need my number or email. Um, you can use a crop consultant, uh, but identify that weed before you try to kill it. All right, prevention is key. It's going to come in on hay. It's going to come in on equipment. So your bush hogs, your mowers, you go to mow a friend's house or uh, mow a, a neighbor's yard. Uh, clean that mower before you take it out of their yard. Uh, leave their weeds in their yard with them. Uh, birds and wildlife also spread the seeds around new animals. So uh, new horses coming in can spread it. Or if you take your horses somewhere else and they eat it and come back in with the seeds in their digestive tract. Uh, wind and water can also spread the seeds. So what can you do? First, soil pH and soil fertility, very, very important. Grazing management is very, very important. Water management is also important. Your goal is to cause your grass, your Bahia grass or Bermuda grass, to outcompete the weeds. That's the goal. So you want to do everything you can to make your grass happy to outcompete the weeds. So mechanical control is an option. We've got mowing or hand pulling. I've got a story about hand pulling crotillaria. It was planted in a pasture that we bought as a soil builder as a, in a USDA project on a pasture. Uh, I was a teenager and of course I got sent to pull this crotillaria that was over my head, uh, pull it up out of the ground and, and burn it uh, because uh, it, it was too tall, too large to stop with a herbicide. So biological controls, those are uh, things like viruses or fungi or insects or vertebrates that will get rid of these weeds for you. Um, we have a, a, um, a biological control for tropical soda apple. It's a, uh, a virus that affects tropical soda apple uh, that we can spray on it and infect it and then it will die instead of having a spray an herbicide. So the last thing we do is contemplate chemical control. That would be herbicides. We wanna make sure we have proper weed ID, 
We want to know the difference between pre-emergent and post-emergent herbicides, perennial or annual weeds. The picture of, it, uh, of the weed here is a, a thistle, and that's actually a biennial weed, meaning it lives for two years. Perennial is a one year or a, a multiple year. Annual is a one year. Biennial is two years. And we also need to know, do we spot treat or versus broadcast? Uh, prickly pear, we're going to spot treat. Other weeds, we may broadcast spray. And then knowing the difference between winter versus summer weeds. Right now, in, this, in the late spring, I'm getting a lot of winter weeds that are already gone to seed. There's no real good control for those weeds right now. Um, and the same thing happens in the fall when I get pictures of summer weeds that are already gone to seed. There's no real good control then. We've got to find it and stop it when it's small. So most pastures uh, are going to fall into having to follow the organooxin herbicide rule. That's if you're spraying 2,4-D dicamba or triclopyr on five acres or more per day. Most of you are going to fall into that category. So you have to keep record of the wind direction and speed every hour uh, as you're spraying that herbicide. All right, with that, if you have any questions on this presentation, you can give us a call at the Extension Office, 850-689-5850.